Hello, and welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I am your host, Greg Steinbrecher. All right, and my guest today is Julia Minson, Associate Professor of Public, of Public Policy, easy for me to say, at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Julia, how are you today? I'm great, thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Um, so you specialize in something I think you call the psychology of disagreement. Would you mind um, explaining what that is and maybe give a little bit of your background, how you, how you kind of got to this point? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a social psychologist by training, um, and I'm just very interested in how do people uh, really engage with folks they disagree with, right? And it could be uh, sort of disagreement uh, in the political realm. Uh, it could be disagreement about how we raise our kids. It could be disagreement at work about how we do a particular project. Um, you know, how do we have sort of thoughtful, productive, uh, engaged uh, conversations and collaborations with people who see the world uh, very differently than we do. And would you say that like the mechanics behind all of this disagreement is more or less the same when, when people disagree about politics or sports teams or how to raise kids? Is there generally the same mechanism in place or or do these things like differ in some fundamental ways um i mean i think i think you are sort of certainly onto something right i mean people disagree about like what kind of coffee they like and that's all fine and good uh right and then when people disagree about policy they end up screaming at each other um and you know, sometimes when people disagree about policy they can have a civil conversation about it uh and so it's sort of really interesting thinking about you know, what are the issues and what are the situations that make people be able to like agree to disagree, as we like to say, right? Versus what makes people sort of jump up and down and scream and call the other person irrational and inappropriate and, you know, immoral. And like, you know, you pick your, like you pick your insult, it goes flying, right? Like what are uh, kind of the key factors? And I think, you know, people like to sort of label these things as like, oh, you know, well, moral issues or ideology issues, but that's, that doesn't quite capture it, right? Because sometimes we can talk about moral issues and we can talk about ideology issues and like be fine. Um, so I think, you know, I think we can get kind of more fine grained about what types of issues bring stuff out in us. Um, but that's sort of less interesting than saying like, okay, if I wanna talk about this particular issue, how do I have this conversation in a civil way? Or what kinds of people are able to have these conversations in a civil way? Or like, how do you set up the circumstances, right? Because it's easy to say like, well, some issues are easy to talk about and some issues are hard to talk about. What are we gonna do with the hard issues, right? We can't just like write them off as hard to talk about and never talk about them. Uh, so the how do we? <laughs> how, uh, I, like, I like how you jump to the million dollar question. <laughs> Get to the point. Um, you know, so uh, this is something that I've been uh, working on for a really long time. Um, and we are, I have a team of folks that I work with sort of across, uh, across now several different universities and across uh, the different schools at Harvard. Uh, and there's a bunch of people kind of working in this space, right? Obviously, uh, sort of this inability to talk to each other is a bigger and bigger problem that uh, folks are kind of noticing more and more with every passing day. Um, one of the things that we have really been uh, zeroing in on is sort of the difference between people's intentions and people's mental states versus their behavior, right? So if you read like the popular press uh, and a lot of it is based on excellent research, uh, a lot of the advice is changing your mental state, 
right? So be more empathetic. Take the other side's perspective. Listen with an open heart, right? Uh, these are all like important things. And if we could do them, they would probably work. Uh, the problem is that outside of a psychology laboratory without somebody like telling you exactly what it is you're supposed to be doing to be empathetic and change your mental state, normal people don't actually know how to do that, right? Uh, it is very, very hard to like precisely say, I want to be empathetic. <laughs> like what is the button I press in my brain? We don't have that button. Um, you know, that's sort of problem number one. Uh, and problem number two is when the person you're talking to uh, is trying to do that, we can't see that they're trying to do it, right? So if a person is like working really, really hard to take my perspective, I can't look inside their brain and give them credit for that effort. Um, the only thing I can actually see is behavior. Right. And so like what's behavior in a conversation? Well, mostly it's words. <laughs> right. Most of conversational behavior is literally the words that come out of your mouth. Um, and so uh, my research team and I have really been focusing on this thing we're calling conversational receptiveness, which is the words and phrases that people can use to signal that they are thoughtfully engaged with the other perspective, right? So instead of telling you to like feel receptive, we're saying, say receptive words. Um, and so what that does is it sort of solves two problems. On one hand, it gives people very explicit instructions on what to say to sound like they're engaging with the other side so that you know, they aren't looking for that button in their brain. They just use the right words and we all know how to use words. Uh, and on the other hand, it makes it transparent when your counterpart is doing it, right? So instead of like being like, are you listening to me? No, you're not listening. Like, why aren't you listening to me, right? Your words can signal that you're listening to me. Um, so I think that is, uh, to me, at least kind of a very exciting new way of thinking about these processes that go beyond like the usual, you know, advice of like, you know, empathize and have an open heart. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I think a lot of the times why people say, you know, empathize, have an open heart, make sure to listen is because that's a way to put the responsibility for having an engaged uh respectful conversation more on you. So when you first say, well, no, it's actually not about that. It almost sounds like, oh, wait, so is it not up to me? But you're saying it's not, you have to take the step beyond thinking right and actually do right and, and express some behaviors. So the question is like, do you, what sort of specific behaviors um, would, would you recommend people manifest, but also I, you said that most conversation is has to do with words and, and, and the words we say, which I'm, I'm thinking to social media and so many of the reasons why people say social media is so toxic is because we only have the words a lot of the time. We don't have the tone of voice, the other person looking back at us, the ability to see, oh, I've hurt someone in your eyes. So, I mean, do these conversational behaviors also help in the social media realm? Are there, are there, are we all a little bit too hard on social media for, for being a words only platform? I know those are like three questions yeah. in one, in one go. <laughs> you can try to knock some of them out. Yeah, I know it's fine. I like, I love this topic. So I'll take all the questions. Um, so I think, you know, to your first question, yeah, absolutely. It is, I think everyone's responsibility to try to have better conversations. Uh, but a lot of the way we think about it is, you know, there's a lot of things we want people to do, right? We want them to like, you know, be healthy and safe for retirement and, you know, get like their vaccines every year and all those things. But one of the things that we've learned from decades of behavioral science is that in the best way to get people to do stuff is to give them incredibly simple, clear, like easy to follow instructions, right? So 
I'm not saying people shouldn't be empathetic. I'm just saying they don't know what that means and they don't know how to enact it, right? Or like if they think they're enacting it, they don't know how to enact it in a way that their counterpart recognizes, right? So an easy way to think about this um, is sort of like the eternal debates every you know couple has ever had about like, are you listening to me? Right, so like my husband and I have been going on about this for 20 years, like, you're not listening to me. Like, no, I am listening to you. Like, this is my listening face, right? <laughs> like, and over time I'm like, oh yeah, that's his listening face. It doesn't look like any listening face I recognize, but to him, that's his listening face, right? So we're just very, very bad at reading people's minds. Um, and when you're like in a stressful situation, when there's conflict, right? When you're expecting the other person to be disagreeing, to be judging you negatively, to be like getting ready to counter argue, those expectations are also going to make it extra hard for you to read their mind, right? So we just want to make it easy for people to, you know, read the signal. Right. And a lot of the cues, you know, I sort of, I, I mentioned conversational receptiveness as being sort of a set of words and phrases. It's not like, it's not rocket science, right? It's a lot of things that many of us would have probably been able to come up with if we sat down and thought, you know, well, like, how do I make somebody feel heard? Right. So one thing is acknowledging the other person's perspective, but not acknowledging it as like, uh-huh, but spending some words acknowledging the other person's perspective, right? I understand you said blah, 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 or what I heard is yada, 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 right? And so imagine if we are, again, arguing, we are in conflict, people's natural tendency is to use all possible airtime to make their point, right? Like, I can't wait for this guy to finish talking so I can finally say my really, really important thing. <laughs> Right. And like, as soon as the other person takes a breath, you just jump in there as quickly as you can. Uh, this, you know, acknowledgement is uh, sort of a very uh, generous thing to do because you're giving up some of your airtime to restate the other person's point. So you're signaling generosity and you're signaling with your words that you actually heard them. Right. Like they don't have to guess whether you're listening to them or not. They don't have to use, you know, your facial expressions. You've now given them like very concrete evidence that you've actually heard them. Um, other things are things like um, finding areas of agreement, right? So this is something that people in kind of polarized partisan conflict have a very, very hard time with because finding areas of agreement sounds like I'm compromising, right? Like you're the devil and I can't possibly agree with you on anything ever for any reason, right? But that's simply not true because we all agree on lots of things, right? So, you know, we all agree on, you know, we want this country to be a safe place for our children to grow up, right? We all want this pandemic to end as quickly as possible, right? There are plenty of things that you can agree on without actually compromising your positions in any way, shape or form. Uh, and sort of signaling that kind of agreement signals cooperative intent, right? So those are some of the, some of the ideas and, um, you know, it's, it's especially effective, like you said, in text on social media, because you don't have all those other cues. And in fact, part of the reason we're so excited about this work uh, is because so much of our communication is now through text, right? It's social media, it's emails, it's sort of direct texts to each other, right? I mean, you know, now I see like, when I see my friends who are, you know, in fights with their partners, right? It used to be like, you'd like yell at each other. Now you have these texts that go on for pages and pages and pages <laughs> that, you then, <laughs> that you then have to take screenshots of to tell your friends about, you know, what an idiot your significant other is, right? So everything is on text, even things that used to be completely sort of personal and intimate. Um, so it's very, I think it's very important to start understanding how text transmits particular information. So are you a little bit more sanguine about the future uh, in a more digitized social media text driven world than perhaps others engaged in the polarization space are? 
Um, I think so. Yeah. I mean, in a way, I think it sort of doesn't matter how we feel about it because it's, you know, it's happening as it gets coming. Um, you know, we are in this world and, you know, I mean, I think the younger I have, I have two teenage daughters and like, they, they don't know how to pick up the phone. Like they know how to pick up the phone in order to text somebody on it. They don't know how to actually make a phone call. <laughs> so, I mean, we can like, we, we can be against it all day long, but, but this is the world that, that we're living in. Yeah. Um, going back to a few things that you said, you, you, you said that there's lots of agreement on some, on some broader based issues. And I've had this sort of working theory that, you know, perhaps polarization on a, a wide scale is not so great, but it's that everyone has that one issue. So it's like, I can agree with you on, I, I can find some common ground with you on scope of government, uh, some social services, tax rates, et cetera, et cetera. But if you disagree with me on abortion, then we're not having this debate. Or if you disagree on the prevalence of systemic racism, whatever that issue is, and then that issue sort of colors the way we perceive everything else someone believes. So if, oh man, if they disagree with me about abortion, then how they feel about X, Y, Z is now immediately suspect. For, for people who have that issue, and everyone seems to have at least one, how would you go about disentangling that in a conversationally receptive way? Is it about holding sort of letting go of the intensity of that belief in order to have a, a, a respectful conversation? Or are there other things one can do to sort of make sure that people are still able to, to meet and have a conversation? I think, I think that's a really, I, I like your theory. Uh, I think, you know, I think it's true. Uh, and I think, you know, I think there's sort of even sort of like an extra level to it. Um, some people would say, well, you know, I'm sort of like middle of the road on most things, but the reason I'm a registered Republican is abortion, right? Or the reason I'm a registered Democrat is immigration. But then I think people who really uh, have strong opinions on the issues also don't have sort of this, you know, monolithic opinion on even that one issue. Right, so you won't find many liberals who will say, you know, open all the borders and let everybody in, right? Any, even on a particular issue, most people's opinions are actually much more nuanced than what we give them credit for from across the aisle, right? Um, and what tends to happen, so, uh, you know, people tend to exaggerate how polarized the other side is, right? So there is, uh, uh, an old phenomenon called false polarization. Uh, and then there's like new work on uh, the perception gap, right? So both sides think the other side is more extreme. Uh, and I think that's true issue by issue as well, right? So when somebody, you know, says that I sort of have liberal views on immigration, we imagine a person who wants to just like get rid of the border. Uh, whereas in reality, when you start dissecting their views, uh, most of the time they turned out to be much more moderate and much more well-reasoned and much more nuanced. And it depends on this and it depends on that. And this happened to me and I understand, you know, this person had this happen to them. And the more you dig into it, the more you say like, okay, well, maybe I disagree with the view, but I think this is a sensible person, right? Uh, and to me, to me, one of that's sort of the most important outcome we could have in these types of conversations uh, is concluding that the other person is a sensible person who has views that one could reasonably have having had that life experience, right? Um, and I think that's, you know, that's something that's very important. Also, it's like a very important distinction, right? Like I'm not going in to change your view on immigration. I'm going in to understand your view on immigration. Right. Once that's the goal, uh, and you start really sort of thoroughly examining it, uh, what comes out most of the time is people with complex, nuanced, well-reasoned views. 
Cool. Um, so I have a couple of uh, follow-up questions. I want to kind of get into some of the methodology. Some of your research is, is really cool. Um, but I mean, I've heard you say a few times, we tend to make other people or circumstances a little bit worse in our heads. Are we in some ways stuck in a kind of a negative feedback loop where there are some ways in which we are objectively more polarized, you know, bowling alone, great sort, et cetera. We then make polarization worse in our heads. We sort of see um, the devils everywhere and then act in ways that makes objective polarization worse, which we then take into our heads and we just spin, 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 spin. Is that, is that sort yep. of happening to some degree? You got it. <laughs> you got it. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, and I think part of the reason it's so complex, right, is that it crosses sort of different levels, uh, you know, both in terms of individual psychology and uh, the way we interact with technology, the way people are organized geographically, all of these things act on themselves, right? So, uh, you know, obviously, people are born into a particular sort of set of life experiences, right? Into a particular background, they get their beliefs from their parents, first of all, their friends, their peers. We like agreement, right? Agreement feels good. Uh, and, you know, you could sort of spin a fun, like evolutionary psychology story about why agreement feels good, but it sort of doesn't matter. Like it just does, right? Uh, even when you agree with people on stupid things, right? Like, oh yeah, like you're the only other person I've ever met that likes this band. Like all of a sudden you think this person is a musical genius because they share your weird taste, right? So agreement feels good. So we look for other people who agree with us right? We go to college with those kinds of people. We marry those kinds of people. We make friends with those kinds of people. Uh, and the funny thing is that from that point on, all the evidence you hear becomes evidence that's consistent with your beliefs, right? Like if you were to marry somebody from the opposing political party, you might occasionally hear the other perspective in your own home, right? But most of us don't. Most of us marry people from our own political party. And so everyone's kitchen becomes a mini echo chamber where people are just sort of like supporting each other's beliefs. Um, if all you hear is arguments and evidence for your own point of view, why would you not become more convinced that your point of view is right? That is a completely logical consequence of hearing arguments and evidence for your own point of view, right? And the more you start believing your point of view is right, the more you start believing the other point of view is wrong, the less time you want to spend with those people. And so the cycle just sort of perpetuates and it, you know, the way kind of social media plays into this, of course, right, is that they understand the psychology, right? And the social media companies are, out to make money, right? They're businesses. And so they know that if people like things that agree with them, they're gonna show us things that agree with us and you know, we will click on them and they will make more money and like everybody's having a very satisfying experience. <laughs> so, I mean, how would you then, because the thing with engaging with beliefs that you disagree with and getting a, a full rounded perspective is, is not only that it, it can be annoying sometimes, or it can be disagreeable, but it's, it just, it takes time. And there are so many hours in the day to, you know, read another newspaper that comes from your point of view or to seek out people on social media or to, you know, go through kind of real clear politics. You know, is it, is it about the amount of time we spend engaging with opposing viewpoints or is it like the way we engage. Like if, if someone's on a limited schedule, <laughs> how, how would you recommend that they get uh, that diet of the opposite point of view when there's only you know so much you can do at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's absolutely true, right? I think there's two um, there's two forces that you pointed to, right? There's like how much time I have, and there's how much I want to spend how I want to spend that time, right? Like how much do I want to enjoy myself while I'm spending that time? Um, I don't know that how much time I have is sort of like the real limitation, right? Like, 
you know, the number of times today that I opened the New York Times and CNN, like I would not be a less informed citizen if I opened a conservative news source for half of that amount of time, like I would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think for the vast majority of people, it's not about rationing their time because they're busy, like, you know, enriching their minds. Uh, it's strictly about I like what I like and I don't like what I don't like. Um, and what I would say uh, about that aspect of it. Um, I have uh, a paper uh, from a couple years ago with uh, Todd Rogers and Charlie Dorison, where we actually looked at kind of the emotional reactions that people have to uh, opposing perspectives. Uh, and what we find is, you know, people really expect it to be a negative experience, right? So when you, you know, ask liberals, what would it be like to, you know, watch a Ted Cruz speech? Or if you ask conservatives, what would it be like to watch a Bernie Sanders speech? You know, they're like, it's gonna be bad. Like, I don't wanna do it. <laughs> really, really not fun. Um, and then we make them watch it in the study. Uh, and it turns out that like, it's not fun, but it's way better than they expected. So the first thing I would say to people is if you have that motivation to try to uh, enrich your media diet, uh, it's not going to be as awful as you expect it to be, right? Uh, it's going to be 25 to 30% less awful. <laughs> So maybe like, you know, have a piece of chocolate along while you're doing this. Um, that's, I think that's one piece. Uh, and then the other piece is I think that if you're talking to an actual, you know, face-to-face -face human, uh, it can actually be incredibly satisfying and pleasant and uh, sort of worthwhile uh, if you have a good conversation. Right, so like obviously nobody wants to have sort of that big blow up, blow up argument, but if you can figure out how to talk to each other uh, in a way that really helps you understand the other side, um, I think that is time very well spent and it's time that's pleasant uh, and leaves you sort of feeling better about the world. You know, one of the things that I personally hate um, about our kind of current state of political affairs is going around thinking, oh my God, how can those people think that, right? But then once you talk to those people and they explain it, that thought goes away. You're like, oh, okay. And so there's sort of like a source of anxiety that's been hanging over you about like all these crazy people running around where you're like, oh, they're not crazy. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> And so to me, that seems like from, you know, you know, if you're trying to like manage your own emotions about the world, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good payoff. Yeah. So it's, it's like sometimes we, we talk about these things as if being more conversationally receptive or trying to understand the other side that, you know, it's altruistic and it's your burden to bear, but you have to do it in order to be a good citizen. I think what it sounds like you're saying is like that, that actually has benefits. Like doing so will make your life better. It's not just eating your vegetables, it's eating a, a great meal. Um, so one last question before we get to some of the methodology, you said that a lot of this stuff is not rocket science and, and that, you know, we like to agree with people. And I mean, I, I don't have much of an understanding of evolutionary <laughs> biology by any stretch, but it, from what I understand, we evolved to be a cooperative species. And that's a, a big reason why we as a species have thrived. So why is this so hard for us? Is this a, a, a new phenomenon or is there something inherent in us that, that makes it so that we look to disagree even when you know, sort of agreeing or finding common ground makes us feel better and is better for us? So I am no evolutionary psychologist, but I like to play one on TV. Um, I, you know, I think the question of why this is so hard is really, really important. And one answer I've been sort of thinking about has to do with the idea that, as you said, we have evolved 
the most complex social structure, right, of any other species on earth by far. Uh, and a really important prerequisite for having this complex social structure is being able to predict other people's behavior, right? So agreement for the sake of agreement is useful in some cases, right? Like when you're trying to motivate people to sort of like fight on your side. But most of the time, the reason you want agreement, uh, especially agreement about like our perceptions of the world and our perceptions of the environment around us is because you want to be able to predict what other people are going to do in any given situation. Um, and so I think this is part of why having a shared reality is so incredibly important. Uh, and what happens then, right, is that I have my sort of background and my life experience and sort of the evidence of my senses and my eyeballs and my brain and like I see the world the way I see the world. And when you see the world differently because you're just a different human with different life experiences, we now don't have a shared reality. And that's a problem because we are in this incredibly uh, interrelated complex social structure. And so we need to arrive at a shared reality. And for both of us, that means that I need to convince you and you need to convince me that my reality is the right reality, <laughs> right? Because it's almost impossible to like unsee the evidence of your own senses, right? If I have some very sort of vivid emotional life experiences where this happened to me or this happened to people I really care about or you know I saw this kid on TV and this thing happened it's very hard for me to step away from that and recognize intellectually that like yeah but there's other kids who've had you know different things um, so I think that's I think that's the driver of it is coming coming to different realizations based on our experiences and then not being willing to accept that people can see the world differently. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, you hear that a lot now, like we have to get to this shared understanding. We all have to accept facts. We, or we, there, there seems to be this push towards wanting to establish a shared reality um, and not Sort of ignoring fake news and, and that actually seems to be a bone of contention is like where how do we which shared reality are we all going to to get towards so is it would you say it, it's best to sort of let go of that sense of a need of shared reality or is it about establishing a shared reality that's a little bit more banal a little bit we're all humans and we all want our children to thrive and to have enough to eat. You see what I'm saying? I see a slight difference. I think so. I think so. I think what I think there's a third version perhaps, which is establishing a shared reality that's more complex. Right? Like we all want our children to eat, you know, but we also, you know, want the planet to not, you know, catch fire. So we need to somehow have people working and have it be you know, environmentally sustainable, right? So there's a lot more yes and, and also, and also. <laughs> um, so that's, I think that's, that's my hope is to make, I think the conversations that are successful are conversations that recognize the complexity uh, and the idea that sort of like multiple multiple things that seem like the opposite of each other can actually be true at the same time. Yeah, reintroducing complexity into our right uh, into into a world that's trying its best to simplify things as much as possible. Right, which is where we get back to your point about social media being bi being bad for things. Right, uh, you know, perhaps the issue is in text, but the issue is sort of the shortness of the text. Interesting. So we, we almost immediately cut to the chase, which is not how I imagined this conversation going. I know you have a lot of uh, great research um, and some really interesting studies. I just wanted to, you know, are, is there anything you'd like to share that sort of like speaks to some of what we've talked about, some of the methodology and interesting study or two that you think is, is worth 
uh, worth sharing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the reasons I was sort of particularly excited about coming on this podcast and talking to you is because uh, one of the projects I'm working on right now uh, was directly inspired by Braver Angels. Um, I am uh, sort of working on a set of studies with uh, Hannah Collins uh, and Charlie Doris and Francesca Gino, um, where we, uh, when we initially heard about uh, Braver Angels and the work y'all are doing, we we're like, oh, well, this is like, this is really cool. Let's see, you know, how they're doing and what they're doing and sort of what their method is. Um, and we, you know, looked at your materials and we talked to some folks in the organization. Uh, and a lot of uh, sort of what we heard about, like the Red Blue workshops really sort of resonated with what uh, the research has sort of validated in the past. Uh, and then there was this one idea that none of us had heard of before. Um, and the idea was, uh, I think uh, David Blankenhorn explained this to us. Uh, and the idea was sort of establishing, you know, what he referred to as persuasion free zones. Uh, and like, you know, we're gonna sit down, we're gonna talk, but we're not going to try to convince each other, right? I'm like, okay, well, if you're not gonna try to convince each other, like, what do people think they're gonna do? Well, they're gonna learn about each other. And we, all of us sort of thought, I don't know that that's been actually sort of experimentally studied. Like, it's a nice idea. Does it work? <laughs> well, now we know it does. <laughs> Uh, but it works in a, it works in a, not, I don't think in the way that we certainly expected it to work. Um, so we started, basically, we started out by just asking people, uh, what goals they have when they talk to somebody, uh, on the opposite side of a polarizing issue. Um, and interestingly, you know, the goals sort of fall into these two categories that, uh, you can kind of, you know, intuitively imagine, right? Uh, people talk about wanting to persuade the other side, right? Like I'm going to convince them that I'm right and they're wrong and my evidence is good and, you know, their evidence is crap. Uh, and people also want to talk, talk about learning, right? I want to understand where they're coming from. I want to sort of learn their reasons. I want to like, you know, figure out sort of like why they have these beliefs. The interesting thing is that when you ask two people in an argument uh, about their goals and about their counterparts goals, everybody thinks that the other side is less interested in learning than they really are. So I am a reasonable person who wants to persuade you and learn about your point of view. You on the other hand are a jerk who is just out to persuade me. Okay, so people systematically and robustly underestimate how much the other side wants to learn about them, right? And like, we know they underestimate it because we asked the other side and they're like, yeah, I wanna learn about you. <laughs> but counterparts don't believe that about each other. Um, and so we thought, huh, that's really, really interesting. Let's do the thing that Braver Angels does. Let's put like everybody in a learning mindset and then everything will be great. Uh, and we ran lots of experiments and spent lots of money uh, and didn't get anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we realized that the reason we weren't getting anywhere was because of the first thing we're already figured out, which is that people already think they're good at learning about their other side. So we keep giving them instructions to like, you know, listen and learn and try to understand and ask questions. And I think our research participants mostly wrote us off because they thought they are already doing it. Um, what made a huge difference was when we told our research participants that the other side is there to learn about them. And that's, that turned out to be like the magic sauce. So if you uh, say to someone, you know, here's this person who disagrees with you on this issue uh, and they filled out a questionnaire about their goals for this conversation, here's this questionnaire, 
in this questionnaire, they said that they really want to learn about your perspective, that conversation goes beautifully, right? The same exact words, the same exact behavior is sort of interpreted through a different lens because you now think that this person wants to learn about you and therefore isn't like the jerk you imagine them to be before the conversation. And I think what happens is when you guys do your workshops, right? It's like everybody is told to be in a learning mindset. So people think, well, I'm already doing it. And now the other guy has to do it too. <laughs> So I think that I think that a big part of the magic sauce is changing our beliefs about other people and sort of like their willingness and their ability to learn, right? Because learning is something that's very um, humanizing, right? Learning requires intelligence, it requires empathy. And so if I think this person is out here to learn about me, I automatically think that they are a more intelligent, more cognitively, cognitively sophisticated and more emotionally sophisticated person than I thought before. So uh, I think I think I learned something from you guys. <laughs> so interesting. And yeah, I mean, you talk to people who do a Braver Angels workshop, uh, especially right afterwards, and there's almost this euphoria that's happening. And I, is, so you're saying that that's, pro according to your research, probably the reason why is because they're in an environment where they want to be learned about and they've been open to learning to, about other people? Well, I think, I mean, I think, you know, your workshops are very complicated, uh, very complicated events, right? There's sort of like a lot of ingredients. Uh, and, you know, that kind of feeling of euphoria that you, that you are referring to, we saw, we looked at the uh, annual report and you have, you know, like 80, 90% of people saying that this was a wonderful experience, right? Think about, you know, if you take your average like Republican and Democrat off the street and say, you know, how would you guys like to sit there for a day and talk to each other about politics? Like most people would not anticipate this to be a wonderful experience. <laughs> so, so this is part of, the, part of the earlier point that if you have these conversations it's like, it feels great, right? I mean, it is pro-social, but it's also just lovely to know that there are good, interesting, insightful, complex people on the other side. Uh, you know, so that's, that's sort of one thing. Uh, and then I think the workshops have lots of components, uh, but sort of like one component that I think is very important is this, uh, you know, this, affirmation that people have that, you know, today, this person on the other side is here to learn about me. And that uh, kind of changes all kinds of assumptions we have about that person. And that I think is a big part of what makes the conversations go so well. So does it have to be backed up by anything? Do, 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 does the other person actually have to to be interested in learning about us or do we all just have to convince ourselves that everyone is interested in learning about us or do we just have to get into an environment where we can relax into the fact that people are interested in learning about us? I think so. I, I think it's kind of the last thing you said because remember that when we ask people simply to like predict how much the other person wants to learn about you, they underestimate, right? So this is back to like, I can tell that you're listening to me. Turns out you are listening to me, but I'm not giving you credit for it, right? Like you're being a good guy and listening and I'm yelling at you for being a bad listener, right? I think that happens a lot in the world uh, is people don't give the other person credit for wanting to learn. Now, it could also be that like, we're, we go in wanting to learn, right? Like I go in saying like, I'm going to sit down like with my uncle and find out why he voted the way he did, right? And then as soon as, you know, he makes sort of his first statement, my desire to learn is like flooded 
with my desire to argue, <laughs> like my desire to learn lasted for 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so, you know, back to conversational receptiveness. If you have good intentions to start with, uh, what can you do to make them transparent in your behavior, right? Can you acknowledge the other person's point of view instead of counter arguing, right? Can you find points of agreement? Can you ask more questions before you jump in with your point uh, so that the like learning intention becomes learning behaviors? Um, and I think, you know, your point about kind of faking it is a really interesting point. It, like it comes up all the time. Um, my, you know, my thinking on it is that, you know, if we all fake a little civility, it wouldn't be the worst thing for the world, <laughs> right? Like, let's have some reasonable conversations without yelling, even if we don't feel it in our heart of hearts. Uh, my suspicion is uh, the result of some fake civility uh, will very soon be real civility, right? Because if I ask you some questions and I really listen to your answers, I will come to learn that you are probably more complicated and thoughtful than I did at the beginning of the conversation. And then I will actually have interest in your opinions because I will have sort of less stereotypes about you, right? So I think that um, signaling a desire to learn, even if it's not 100% genuine is still a positive thing. And I think it have kind of like a positive feedback loop. Uh, if we keep doing it. So the, a positive feedback loop to get us out of that negative feedback loop uh, that we were talking about earlier. It almost sounds like the secular version of Pascal's wager, but the whole point of that was to get people into church that like eventually they would become a good church going um, citizen. So it's, it's about sort of like by convincing yourself that those habits are good and then partaking in those habits, you'll eventually get to a place of good behavior. And then if enough people do that, we eventually get to a society that's a little more respectful, a little more able to have uh, better conversations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's right, that's exactly right. And that's true for a lot of habits we have, right? That we want to encourage, right? People don't sort of start out saying like, I want to live on kale and carrots, right? But they say like, you know, okay, I'm going to commit to having like two salads a week, right? And over time you grow to like salad and then you feel better. And this is sort of, you know, good for you. And I would imagine having a little bit of being a little easy on yourself if you fail, you know, I want to be a little bit better conversationalist. I'm going to try, I might not quite get there at times, but picking up the lessons and, and moving forward and not feeling like I have to be perfect each time. Like if you slip off a diet, um, better to forgive yourself <laughs> than to then spiral downwards. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. Right. And giving yourself, I think there's, you know, there's, there are several different versions of being sort of patient and forgiving with yourself. Right. One is that sometimes you have good intentions and then you end up yelling at somebody. Uh, doesn't mean that like you can never try again. Uh, another, uh, I often hear about, I often hear this from people uh, that like, there's some topics, you know, there's some topics I can talk about and some topics I can't, right? Like I can talk about immigration, you know, but like as a woman, I can't talk about sexual assault, right? Like that's where I draw the line. Okay, fine. <laughs> That, that's okay, right? We don't need to all like engage in the most gut-wrenching, like stressful conversations every minute of every day, right? Or, you know, I have another moderate, like reasonable sounding friend. I wanna talk to that person about their views on immigration. I don't wanna talk to my like, you know, crazy grandpa. Cause that's just like too much and too close to home okay, great. <laughs> like, let's leave grandpa out of it for a bit. <laughs> right. So baby steps. Interesting. So, I mean, we're unfortunately pushing up against the end of our time. And I feel like we've just 
reached the, the, or just hit the tip of the iceberg here. I looked at your research and there's so much more we could get to and expand on. So uh, please, please come join us again and talk even more about your research. But I mean, in, in, in the last few minutes we have, oh man, where do I wanna go? Um, are, are, would you say, I think two questions. One, would you say people are a little bit more predisposed to be a, a learner or a persuader, and, and and it's about sort of teaching the persuaders to be learners, or or are we all just sort of stumbling into conversations, and it's it's about convincing others that that we can be learners? I don't know if that question made sense. It made sense. Yeah, in my head. I think I think I think it's the second one. I mean, I think stumbling is a really good descriptor for most of human behavior <laughs> right uh you know the social world is incredibly complicated and there are lots of things happening at any given time right you know anytime you walk into a conversation uh you're in a particular mood something just happened or didn't happen, you know, your counterpart, you know, is a person you like or a person you don't like, you have a particular history, there's a particular topic. So there's just sort of like a million things at play uh, in any one conversation. Um, so I think it's incredibly, incredibly hard to just like suddenly, you know, get up in the morning and become good at this. Um, but I would say, you know, people want to sort of like, take away anything from this uh, is to try to actively uh, think about how do you signal your willingness to engage with somebody else, right? How do you use your words and your behavior uh, to make it totally transparent that you want to learn about the other person, right? Don't make them guess, right? Use specific words like, I would love to learn about your point of view on this. <laughs> Right, and then let them talk. <laughs> uh, thank you for taking the yarn of that question and spinning it into gold. Uh, so you work in academia. You said you're an associate professor at Harvard. I, I, so academia right now, I think speaking of, of being able to like take the worst examples of something and, and consider it to be representative of the thing, I think a lot of people when they think of academia now, they think of it as being a little bit more closed-minded about not being open to conversations. For some people that, when one imagines academia, they think of speakers being shouted down. Uh, they think of Gen Zers who were, you know, in their safe spaces, not open or willing to have difficult conversations. So I was just curious, you know, how does, you, and I know you have a, I think you've taught Brave Rangers before. You, you mentioned you, you wrote a, a case about it. I'm wondering how does, how do they react to the concept of Brave Rangers, but also more broadly, your research? How is it accepted, not just by students, but perhaps in the faculty lounge? Are, are people open to this? Are they excited about it? Or do you get that answer I think a lot of people would expect, which is, you know, some things you can't talk about. I'm not listening to the other side. Uh, we're in our ivory towers and, and you know, everyone else can, can the hoi polloi can, can stuff it. <laughs> uh, so both, I mean, honestly, both. Um, you know, I think academia, um, certainly, you know, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the elite institutions are really uh, sort of having a reckoning now with, you know, well, we're all about you know, diversity, right? Diversity is a very important theme and a very important goal. Uh, diversity of political views is something that, you know, we struggle with. Um, and, you know, I work at the Harvard Kennedy School, which is a school of public policy where we have, uh, for example, a tremendous number of international students. We have a tremendous number of uh, military students, right? The US military uh, is largely conservative uh, and so we have our, you know, conservative military students who, you know, don't feel like they fit in a lot of the times because the rest of the student body is overwhelmingly liberal. Uh, and figuring out how to create a situation where people with, you know, ideas, smart, good ideas from all sides of the political spectrum can feel comfortable expressing them 
uh, I think is like of paramount importance. Um, when I present my work, I get, I get both sides, right? So I get the like, this is wonderful, let's fix polarization, which, you know, it's the opinion of sort of the majority of Americans, right? But I also get like, no, we have to hold the party line and I will never compromise, you know, with the idiots on the other side. Um, and that's, you know, sort of like a perfect encapsulation of the problem because once you paint the entire other side <laughs> with one brush, <laughs> like you are now the problem. <laughs> Um, there... One of the things that I like to, one of the things that I sort of like to remind people is that the goal of conversation is not persuasion. That's one of the goals, right? But there's lots of other goals. Uh, as long as we have to sort of live with each other, uh, there are other things we need to be doing in terms of understanding the other side, uh, being able to collaborate, being able to plan, uh, being able to solve problems together. Uh, those are all things that can and should be accomplished without necessarily having to compromise on anything, right? So people who say, I can't be receptive to the opposing view because that would mean betraying my values, you're just forgetting about what the purpose of most conversation is. <laughs> um, so that's sort of my answer to that. Great. Um, I think that's a, actually a pretty great place to end on. Uh, what What's next for you? I know you have this paper that's coming out about uh, learning and persuasion. Where can people find that? And then what are what what's after that? And then how can people uh, find you and, and engage with your work? Uh, so the learning and persuasion paper is still uh, a work in progress. I will send it along once uh, it exists on paper. Um, you can find uh, all of my research on juliaminson.com. Uh, we are uh, continuing to do more of this work, starting to think about how can we uh, train conversational receptiveness, particularly can we train it in schools, right? Can we train it with like teenagers before they become super polarized? Um, can we use it to decrease other types of conflict? Like, can you use it for marital conflict, for example? Uh, the world is pretty full of conflict. So <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of things keeping us busy. <laughs> well, Julie Minson, thank you so much. Uh, there was so much I wanted to get to today and I feel like we got to a quarter of it. So uh, please, please uh, come back sometime and, and share, update us and, and share even more of your wonderful research. Thanks for having me, Greg. Oh, thank you. And uh, to everyone listening out there, if you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with someone you know who you think might be interested and think about reviewing and rating this podcast. And if you haven't already, please join Braver Angels. You can find out about us on our website, braverangels.org. Thanks to everyone for listening and let's depolarize America. <laughs>